Okay, everyone, thanks a million for coming tonight, considering the beautiful weather outside. I'm surprised we even have an audience of two. But anyway, thanks a million for coming along. My name is Paul Martin. I'm current chair of the Chartered Institution of Billing Services Engineers in Ireland. And um, we have two great speakers today on a very hot topic, which is NZEB. First of all, we'll have uh, Owen up from ACOM. Owen Doon is a principal mechanical engineer with ACOM. And then we'll have Orla, who is Programme Manager for Near Zero Buildings in the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland, and has the pleasure of sitting beside me. So, there you go. Okay, so I just want to give you just a quick introduction to SIDSI. I don't know how many of you are aware of us, but um, we're a group of building services engineers, mechanical engineers, facade, fire, etc. Um, what we are here to do is provide is CPDs, support and events for char for billing services engineers and the industry in itself. So when you become, or if you want to become a member of SIBSI, you get uh, a monthly magazine with all news related, CPD, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And then there's societies like the Facade Engineers, and we also have a new society which is the BIM. So if you join that, you get five documents that are related to the British Standard in BIM. So it's uh, well worth joining if you're into that area. We also do a lot of networking events, uh, which I'll go into in a little bit. Uh, in a little bit. So we also have Yen, which is the Young uh, Engineers Network, and the BIM, and also WIBSI, which is Women in Building Services Engineering. So we do a lot, as well as social events. We have the Golf Day Out, which is on the seventh of September. We also have our. We normally have an annual lunch, but this year we're going for a dinner because we're celebrating our 50th anniversary in Ireland. So um, unfortunately it's sold out at the moment, but I can talk to you about a way of getting in. Uh, so it's on the 30th of November, and we also on Thursday night, Adam and Damien will be organizing a five-a-side soccer tournament. Again, sold out. So we also do student awards with DIT and Waterford Institute of Technology, and we also sponsor the SDAR awards and I'm not sure if you're aware of the SDAR Awards, but if you're looking to publish a paper on building services engineering, I would highly recommend to go into the SDAR website and uh, you can submit an application there. We're also involved in standards development. I'm current chair of the building services section in NSAI, but also our financial guy, Charles, is the chair of the electric standards, so the ET101, the new draft of that. And we're involved in regulation development, such as Partel, and part F. So as I alluded to earlier on, we're 50 this year, so we have the dinner, but along with the dinner, we have an awards uh, event. So this is sponsored by Daikin, Hevac and Wilo. So there's three awards, and it's for mechanical and, or electrical, but we want both the contractor and the consultant to submit an application. So what we're looking for here is any building in Ireland over the last 50 years that you believe was progressive. So even if you had a 1960s building, if it was at that day a new building that had maybe chill beams or whatever it was, or a new type of refrigeration system or whatever it is, we would like you to submit an application. So it's under three categories, under two million, between two and five million, and the categories are based on services costs. So there's kind of four areas that we want you to look at. Um, so we'd like you to submit the applications by the 12th uh, of, or the 27th of July, 12 p.m. We'll take queries till the 13th of July. And so kind of what we're looking for is, we're not looking for anything extraordinary here. We're looking for, the first section would be like the project summary. So what was the client's brief? What did you work on? How did you adapt that client's brief? So your overall design approach, how you took the basic plans that the architect changed 20 or 30 times and made it into reality. And then specific elements of the design implementation. How did you bring it in, particularly if you're a contractor, how did you bring what the consultant did into a working, living building? Project delivery, things like timelines, etc., etc. Costs are all taken into consideration and then any kind of the high project key performances. So if it was a new building, was it better than NZEB? If it was an older building, how did it relate to buildings at, those, at, at that space and time? So there's more information on our website, which is sibsi.org, sibsiireland.org. Please come to us if you're thinking of submitting an application. We'd love to have 
uh, you dare on the night. And if you are one of the successful um, people, are the shortlisted, we're going to shortlist three per category. And if you're one of the people, we'll invite you then to the dinner. So we won't see you getting an award without being presented or without being there. So we're going to try and keep it to about an hour and a bit tonight, because I know you're all dying to get out and eat ice cream and all the rest. So first up, we have Owen. And Owen's going to talk a little bit about the background on NZEP. And we're going to have questions at the very end, if you don't mind. So thank you. Thanks, Paul. Let me see. Uh, that's working. Okay. So thanks for coming. Um, my name is Owen Doon. I'm a, a principal mechanical engineer with ACOM in, in Dublin, and I'm here to talk to you about a, a very hot topic uh, at the moment. Sorry, we're getting, uh, which is nearly zero energy buildings or NZEB. I'm sure it's something you've probably all heard of. So just in, in terms of the agenda, I'll give you a background to NZEB in Ireland, uh, the impact on non-domestic buildings, followed by the impact on domestic buildings, schools, uh, a quick summary, and then in terms of questions and answers, we'll leave it to after Orla's presentation, and Orla's going to give a bit more detail on the actual cal calculation methodologies that go, go along with NZ. So just a quick note on ACOM in Ireland, um, we're a multidisciplinary uh, organisation with 92,000 staff globally, 600 uh, in Ireland across five offices, and we offer a full suite of design services from buildings, civils, infrastructure, roads, um, and environmental. Um, and these are just an example of uh, some of the projects we have on at the moment. So uh, background to NZEB. So what, what is NZEB? So the definition of NZEB is a, a nearly zero energy building, a building that has a very high energy performance uh, and the very low amount of energy required should be covered to a very significant extent by uh, energy from renewable sources, including uh, produced on site or nearby. And that's from what's called the Energy Performance of Building Directives, which is an EU directive. Uh, it's from Article 2.2. I suppose that the background to NZEB it comes from a theory which is called zero energy building, which is a zero energy building is a building which gives as much back to the, the grid as what it uses. So it's it's net zero. Um, and the energy performance of, uh, of building directives, so what is that? It's the main U European legislative document to improve energy performance of buildings. Um, it was uh, recast in 2010, and that's when this definition of, of uh, NZEB came in. Um, and the Article 4 is probably some of the key articles in it that member states must set minimum energy performance requirements for new buildings, renovations and replacement of existing buildings. And the deadlines were the 31st of December 2018 for all new buildings and the 31st of December 2018 for all public buildings or those buildings that were occupied by public authorities. So what were the requirements of the EPDBU to establish a ca calculation methodology? Uh, there was minimum energy performance requirements, um, requirement for display energy certs, or these are BER certs, which you can see there, um, and also inspection schemes for heating and air conditioning systems, and also for member states to draw up lists of financial managers to improve energy efficiency of buildings. So these were some of the requirements that were in the energy performance of building directives. Now, there's a myriad of legislation that, glo that goes, as it being the EU, that uh, uh, also applies. So we have got the energy efficiency directive, so different requirements, long-term national building renovation strategies. Uh, governments had to make uh, energy efficient renovations to at least 3% of buildings, and they should only purchase buildings which are highly energy efficient. Um, and also energy sales companies had to achieve energy savings of 1.5%. And you'll see this quite a lot with the likes of Electric Ireland who will give businesses incentives to reduce energy, and that's all because of the energy efficiency directive. Uh, Eco-design directive, uh, another directive which gives mandatory uh, requirements for energy efficiency products and I suppose those products apply to anything that can consume energy or have an impact on the energy consumption of buildings, so includes things like insulation. Uh, and it was uh, the energy labelling directive and that's a framework for labelling products which fall under the Eco-design directive and you'll see that all on uh, your fridges or your cookers at home. So what was the, the uh, impl impl implementation timeline for Ireland? So I suppose just to note, as I mentioned, this is around since 2010 when the directive first came in. So these dates are, we're, we're very much getting towards, the deadline was the 31st of December 2020. So we're kind of at the back end of that and that's why this legislation is, is uh, coming in at this stage. So the first uh, 
piece of document that was issued was the interim NZEB specification and this was for public sector buildings and um, that's largely been superseded by the revised part L of the building regulations for non-domestic buildings so that was issued in 2017 and the implementation dates for that are uh, the work or material alteration or change of use commences before on or before 31st of December and substantial work has been completed by 1st of January 2020 and substantial work is designed, uh, defined as the structure of the external walls so anything after those dates uh, will be required to fall under these uh, revised building regulations for NZEB. Um, in 2018 the Department of uh, Education and Schools issued a specific uh, TGD 33 outlining how schools were to achieve NZEB. Um, there was a Part L 2011 amended version in, in January 2017 uh, that was issued for information but the main document for, for dwellings is the Part L uh, for dwellings which is released in April 2018 but only for public consultation so the current implementation dates for that are uh, work on material alteration or change use commences before 31st of March 2019 and again substantial work completed by 31st of March 21, 2021 Anything before those dates uh, goes under the new old regulations and anything after those dates uh, goes under the new regulations. Part F of ventilation was also uh, revised and we'll go through some of those details. And just to note that this is currently out for public consultation. Um, it's out until the Friday 8th of the June, so there's about a week and a half to uh, to get your comments in. So I'd encourage anybody who has any comments on, on these regulations, this is your chance to to uh, have a say in, in what's going to be in the final document which is released hopefully later this year. So where do these regulations come from? Uh, there was a principle of cost optimality in the energy performance of building directives so uh, what this is saying is in the EPDB what the EU said is that it was up to member states to, to state what the energy performance requirements of an NZ building would be and you had to establish cost optima optimal solutions in order to do that. So what the Department of the Government did was they actually engaged ACOM to produce a number of uh, cost optimality uh, reports for non-domestic and domestic installations. And those cost optimal reports, uh, they came up with a figure that was a 60% reduction in primary energy was the most cost optimal solution. There's also an EU Commission guideline which I have put up there. Now the EU, it's it's only a guideline for different regions, um, so it, it really varies depending on what climate you're in. So I, as I said, it's just a guideline. The main uh, uh, derivation was the cost optimal studies. So these were just some examples of of how the cost optimal studies were done. So on the graph uh, there, you have uh, on the vertical axis is what's the the macroeconomic cost of the building. So the macroeconomic cost is basically the full life cycle cost of the building. Um, including you know the build cost, the maintenance cost, the the running cost. Um, the period is is thirty years for residential buildings and and twenty years for non residential buildings, and all the different blue dots you see there are all various different uh, uh, energy efficient solutions that they they model. So increases in U values, different uh, mechanical ventilation systems, different lighting systems, etc. And I suppose the dot in the bottom left corner bottom left is the most cost optimal solution that's basically the one that delivers the lowest primary energy for the lowest macroeconomic cost so they did that was the the solution and in that solution there was an approximate reduction of about 60 percent so that's how the the figures came were came up with so so why is it so important i suppose we've just a couple of graphs here of energy consumption of buildings i think buildings fall under residential and commercial and public services in that graph so the kind of purple and orange graphs so that represents how much uh, of Ireland's total energy consumption uh, equates to buildings. So it's about 40% in those figures and also applies for carbon dioxide, again, about 40% of, of our total uh, emissions. And just a very quick graph just to see how we compare in terms of our, our uh, CO2 emissions per use for four area. We're actually, this was a graph, and it's quite an old graph of 2011, but it's an interesting one because it shows us right at the bottom of the table. And the main reason for that is because of the inefficiency of our grid. If you look at who's up the top, it's Norway because they have virtually all their energy is, is generated with, with hydropower. So it's it's a bit of a misleading graph. We're not we're not the worst players in Europe, but it certainly, it, it, it just shows you we're, we're, not, we're not, by no means the best either. Um, in terms of dwellings, so how do we compare again to, to the UK and, and, and our uh, EU averages? 
So where at the top of that graph in green, uh, the UK is in red and the rest of Europe is in blue. So we're, we're about 5% above the UK average and about 26% above the EU average. And this is despite having one of the youngest stocks of residential uh, buildings in the EU. So there's been a number of studies done on this in, in Ireland. Um, so DIT, uh, as part of the SDAR, have done a study on the potential for energy consumption by retrofitting uh, uh, energy efficient solutions to the existing uh, dwelling stock. And they've, they've said there's huge potential for energy savings. So that's something that you'll see a lot more grants and things from the SAI. So we'll just go through some of those uh, Partel uh, documents that are issued and just to see what the changes are and how they affect NZEB. So the main one in the, in the, in the non-domestic buildings first, just on the U values, the old element, elemental method uh, where you just had to meet uh, ma the maximum elemental values and you also had to do the overall heat, heat, heat loss method. I think anybody who's done that overall heat loss method would, would see that it wasn't really that difficult to, to achieve, to achieve quite high U values and still uh, meet the overall heat loss method. So that's been replaced um, by what's called area weighted element U, U values and a principle of reasonable provision. So there's the U values on the left hand side. So the new U values, for example, for walls have gone, the maximum average elemental U value was 0.27. That's gone down to 0.21 for the area weighted. So that means you can have, have elements of a wall that are above 0.21, elements that are lower than 0.21, but overall your average ele your average weighted element U value can't be greater than 0.21. And as instead of the overall heat loss method, we have what's called here the principle of reasonable provision. So what that means is that if you were to, whatever building you're designing, whatever heat loss it would have using all those area weighted elemental U values, you can change some of your U values, but overall you have to have the same heat loss as what you would have if you use those figures. There's also much more increased emphasis on thermal bridging. Um, uh, Thermal bridging now needs to be generally needs to be calculated, which it didn't have to be before. There's three options you can use: uh, uh, acceptable construction details from the Department of Housing Planning, local government, certified details from NSAI or Agamont, or you you can use alternative defaults and and then use the default <coughs> NEEP factors. But we've, that's generally less beneficial in your overall U value or your overall calculation. So it's much better to use one of the first two options. Uh, air tightness testing is now mandatory for all buildings. Uh, minimum value of five meters cubed per meter square per hour at 50 pascals. And there's also a lot more emphasis on the construction stage. So there's an uh, emphasis on the contractor that he has to identify the appropriate air battery elements and develop appropriate details along with the architect for those. And there's also a responsibility, you have to establish responsibility for construction of those details. So again, um, more emphasis on construction. Uh, and again, an, establish an on-site inspection regi uh, regime and also quality con controls procedures. So this will all come in with a BCAR uh, sign-off. So the architects who are inspecting this will have to make sure that there was an on-spot inspection regime followed and that there was quality con uh, control procedures followed. Uh, on solar overheating, so obviously solar overheating can add to cooling energy consumption, but also can help in domestic applications in reducing the heat loss or reducing the heating demand, sorry. So the old way was the uh, blanket 25 watts per meter squared again, which was quite restrictive in design and buildings, that's, that's been largely replaced by uh, a, a changed methodology. The new methodology is that there's a reference glazing system provided, and that reference glazing system is that I've showed there, east facing, full width glazing to a height of one meter, uh, G value 0.68, and a frame factor of 10%. So what you do is you calculate the, you, the heat loss from your facade over the period, or sorry, the solar gain over a period of April to September from your building, and it can't be any higher than what the reference uh, glazing system is. Uh, there's also SIBSI TM52 overheat and assessment is recommended. There was some talk that maybe this would be mandatory under the regulations because there is a recognition that in a lot of these new, modern, well-insulated buildings that there can be issues with overheating. So it's not mandatory, but it's recommended in the regulations. And then specifically on, on building services, uh, more stringent uh, heat generator efficiencies for boilers. Heat pumps have to eat, meet eco-design directive def efficiencies. I think that's generally the case anyway. Um, there's also defined minimum controls and BMS for various heating systems, and those uh, minimum requirements are improved over what was there before. Um, the maximum specific fan power has been reduced. It's uh, 1.6 for centralized heating and cooling systems goes up a little bit if you have certain heat recovery uh, or other uh, items in your in your uh, system 
I know a motor is less than 1.1 kilowatts now. It's mandatory to have variable speed drives on those. Uh, air handling le unit leakage classification, minimum L2. Uh, all chillers and cooling systems uh, have to be as per the Eco Design Directive. So again, that'll be they'll have to be certified to either CE or to your event or equivalent certified performance. And there's also minimum control requirement for ventilation systems. Uh, on the lighting side, there's the minimum controls. They're generally as what was there in Part L 2008. So manual switching, daylight sensing, PORs and time controls. The minimum standards for what's called efficacy, effic efficacy which is the overall uh, measure of how efficient the lighting system is. So that's what's in the table there. So it's hard to see probably on that, but basically what it's saying is that if you have no controls, you have to have very high uh, efficacies on your lighting. And the less, uh, the more controls you, you can have, the, the, the lower the efficacy or the lower efficiency you can have your lighting. Now, it's not full AD LED, a lot of those figures that you can achieve there, um, uh, you can achieve with standard CFLs, but L LED is dominant really. And I think when we speak later about the calculation methodology, you'll see that it's very difficult or uh, you'll certainly see huge benefits by using LED lighting throughout. So uh, how is this? That's the kind of prescriptive uh, elements that are in the, the part L. All of this has to be calculated in what's called the non-domestic energy assessment procedure. So I won't go through this in much detail because Orla is going to go through this. But that's it's, it's the procedure for uh, calculating any performance in buildings and demonstrating the uh, compliance with the building regulations. Um, heavily based on UK NCM, which is the National Calculation Methodology. But the general principle which is that you have what's called a reference building, and the reference building is a building that has defined fabric details, efficiencies, etc. And the reference building will have an energy performance coefficient of 1. And your building, uh, if you use all those defined fabric details, you'll also have an energy performance uh, coefficient, roughly. That's roughly what it is, of 1. So. Part L will define the maximum figures for EPC, which at the moment is one, but may may go down in 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 future. So these are the reference build reference building that we have at the moment. So uh, in the TGD L 2017, uh, you'll see that a lot of the U values in the reference building are a lot lower than the elemental U values that are defined that I defined earlier. So even though you might think you're previously it was if you met the prescriptive requirements of Part L. It, there was a fairly good chance that when you did your calculations using the non-domestic energy assessment procedure that you would be in compliance but now i think it's it's that's not that's not guaranteed you will have to do the calculations at, at an early stage and as i said a lot of those figures are are a lot lower than what the prescriptive requirements are for example on the on the 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 walls and also on the air permeability it's down at three versus five for what the prescriptive requirements are um, and again, with the lighting, it's 65 lumens per circuit watt. Again, that's if you have uh, um, LEDs, it, it'll be quite easy to achieve that. Um, there's also a, a new requirement in called what's called the re renewable energy ratio. So the renewable energy ratio uh, is a new requirement. So the, the minimum energy, uh, the minimum renewable energy ratio with an EPC of one. So if your building is as efficient as the as the reference building in TGD then you have to use 20% uh, uh, renewables. So it's what is the renewable energy ratio? It's it's the primary energy from renewable sources and that's uh, determined by NEEP. And they're the list of, of the renewable energy sources. So mix of solar, thermal, PV, biomass, biofuel, heat pumps, CHP, aerothermal, geothermal, hydrothermal, wind, biomass, and biogases. So they're the list of, of the new renewable energies. So as I mentioned, if, if you have uh, an energy performance coefficient of one in your building so that's if your building is as efficient as the reference building in in the new regulations then you have a, a minimal uh, renewable energy ratio of 20 percent but if you have an energy performance coefficient of 0.9 so that means if your building is 10 percent more efficient than what the reference building is you only need to provide 10 percent of of renewables um, as I said, CHP is defined as, as a renewable, but it has to be sized in accordance with SIBSI AM12. I suppose this is to prevent uh, oversizing. So other requirements that are in the regs, um, in terms of commissioning and construction quality, as I mentioned, a lot more emphasis on on-site quality control. Air tightness testing is now mandatory. Uh, ductwork leakage testing is mandatory in high-pressure ductwork. It'd probably be rare. 
Um, systems have to be adequately commissioned to meet design requirements and commissioning in McLaren has to be drawn up by the design engineer at design stage and also ad adequate operation and maintenance manuals now a building net regulation requirement and I think you might say that a lot of those things are common sense but they're common sense for most projects but for a lot of projects they, they wouldn't have been done so now that there are uh, a mandatory requirements in the building regulations and with the with the BCAR uh, uh, sign-offs it'll you know you really have to do those things now it, it's no longer optional or a nice to have so solutions or challenges I suppose with these new regulations I think one of the main challenges will and Orla will go through it more when she talks about the calculations is how the renewable energy ratios will be met and there's a recognition that achieving RER uh, with PV is quite difficult especially on large high-rise buildings where you have a limited space for roof um, obviously heat pumps is in there as, as, a, as a, a renewable solution so it's quite easy to not easy but it's uh, achievable to to meet your renewable energy ratios with with a uh, vrf system but i think chill water and L lphw with fan coil with 4.5 fan coil units is generally the high spec uh, office specification especially in dublin so um that that we think feel that will remain so it's a, what what we don't know yet what's going to be the default solution um there is a revised neap we're, we're, we're under a kind of a interim uh scheme at the moment again Orla will talk about it but when that revised NEEP comes out we'll probably have more answers on exactly what these solutions will be but the ultimately the less primary energy you have the less renewables you have and the, more, and the easier it is to to achieve partel so I mean buildings hopefully there'll be a lot more emphasis on mixed mode and natural ventilation buildings which have a much lower primary energy consumption um, so again, there's a, a much more emphasis on existing buildings as well. So the new building U values apply to uh, extensions, and material oscillations also have to have revised U values. Sorry. So any building that's undergoing uh, a material change of use or material alteration has to be upgraded. So material change of use. So again, if we're taking, for example, we see a lot of warehouses which might be converted to offices. That's a change of use. Um, you have to upgrade the U values to, to, for all the building elements in, in line with those tables. Um, you also have to use the limiting thermal bridge and air infiltration details, acceptable construction details, among other requirements. Uh, extended boiler systems, which are extended, have those systems have to meet new system efficiencies. Controls have to be upgraded to minimum standards. And again, specific fan powers have to be meet minimum requirements. Lighting, any new lighting has to be as per the, the, the a new building requirements. And again, re major renovations. So a major renovation is, is defined as anything that where 25% of the surface area of the building envelope, envelope undergoes renovation. So that includes cladding or dry lining. Um, what's defined here is that the proportion, performance of the entire building has to improve to cost optimal levels. And the cost optimal solutions are de defined as Oil gas systems which are less than or greater than 15 years old have to be replaced. Same goes for cooling systems or lighting systems which are greater, greater than 15 years old. And also direct uh, heating s controls need to be uh, upgraded. So again, any there'll be a lot of major renovations and any of those systems which are greater than 15 years old in, in major renovations uh, need to be upgraded. There's an alternative method which is to uh, meet primary energy performance uh, requirements so basically what you would do then is you would upgrade your building but you would calculate uh, you would put the building into the NEAP model and calculate the primary energy performance or primary energy consumption and if it was below these ta these figures in those tables then you will have be seen to achieve the requirement on a major renovations but what's worth noting is that those figures there for example an office of 180 uh, watts per meter square uh, kilowatts per meter square per year that relates to somewhere above 340 under the current regulations. So really any buildings that are built to the current regulations um, that are upgraded within un, as part of re major renovations in the next five to 10 years are really gonna have to have uh, very strain, uh, hu uh, large upgrades to, to meet these requirements. So on schools, as I mentioned, the, the, the department released uh, their own specific uh, guidelines, TGD 33. Um, it covers new buildings and buildings with plannings, planning permission uh, granted or currently in design. So they've actually take, gone a step further and said that they want their all their schools to have a minimum energy performance coefficient of 0.9. So that's 10% better than the current uh, regulations. 10% uh, on-site renewables from voltaics. They're defining that they, uh, voltaics is the 
a renewable strategy they want to use. That's because they've done studies um, and based on the variable hours of operation, the lack of technical expertise uh, within, the depart- within, say, people within schools in terms of maintaining those systems, the minimum uh, optim- uh, O&M requirements for photovoltaics, the reliability, the energy use profiles, etc. of the schools, they've defined as photovoltaics is the most suitable renewable solution. Uh, for schools, there's potential for biomass via energy supply uh, agreements, but I think that's going to be quite rare. Again, their infiltration rates are, are lower than the minimum requirements in the in the, the part L, and also their their backstop U values are, I think, generally about the same, as far as I know. Uh, and also, the SBEM has been revised specifically based on Irish school data, so again, we're expecting that later. Um, for planning permission or schools that are already in design or have planning permission. Um, the fabric and infiltration backstops are, are, are to be used and also LED lighting is required throughout. So basically what they've said is that they feel that if you're midway through the design in the school, it's, it's achievable to upgrade the fabric and infiltration requirements at that stage. So they're saying that, that it's mandatory for those schools. Um, and again, the, the major, reno, major refer, refurbishments requirement, similar uh, uh, system, similar uh, strategy to the uh, department's guidelines that Cost optimal solutions have to be are required. So again, boilers, uh, ventilation systems, and lighting systems that are greater than fifteen years old will need to be replaced. PV is to be considered, but not mandatory. This is not really related to NZ, but it's, it was in, introduced as part of TGD thirty three, and it's a traffic light system for ventilation. So I think there's a recognition now that uh, within schools there can be issues with air quality. So it's now mandatory to have um, CO two sensors and a traffic light system. Um, to say whether the CO2 levels are too high so it can indicate the teachers uh, to, to what the air quality requirements are like. So this is a, not specifically uh, to do with NZ, but it's a, a good, uh, good requirement. So NZ for dwellings. As I mentioned, there was a Part L 2017 amended uh, which just redu- uh, reduced the energy performance coefficients and the carbon performance coefficients from about 0.4 down to 0.3 for the EPC. Um, that was only issued for information, so there's the figures <coughs> that it reduced to. That was all associated with the dwelling energy assessment procedure, um, and again, Orla will go through that in more, in more detail. So the dwelling energy assessment procedure is the calculation methodology for, for dwellings. Um, as I mentioned, there is a Part L 2018 for public consultation out for the moment. Um, it only has an element of the U-value method. There is no overall u method. Uh, U-value method anymore in the revised in these draft regulations, as you can see, the U-values for walls have gone from 0.21 to 0.18, and um, likewise for floors, windows gone from 0.16 to 0.14. And I suppose this is a good a good introduction that the renewable energy ratio is now 20 percent of instead of the fixed uh, renewables requirement in kilowatt hours per meter squared, and CHP uh, is also acceptable as an alternative to uh, renewables or as a renewable, sorry. Again, max air tightness of five meters cubed per, per meter squared is a little bit lower. Um, mandatory air tightness testing, I think this was generally been done uh, across the sector anyway. <clears throat> there is a recognition in houses, there's also a risk of overheating. So there's, you do have to do a, 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 an over, overheating risk assessment and if m- possibly maybe mitigation measures required in certain areas, uh, blinds for example. Again, minimal c- controls and efficiency requirements for heat pumps, higher efficiency for ventilation systems. And again, major renovations, 25% of the building envelope, uh, cost optimal solutions have to be uh, uh, followed. Um, so what they do in the revised part L as well, which is another welcome introduction, is, the, is they, there's a couple of fixed systems. So there's four different solutions for semi-detached houses and two for mid-floor apartments with different ventilation, different heating systems. And I suppose what this does is it gives, you know, people who aren't uh, au fait with the, the the dwelling energy assessment procedure who don't know much about um, and building services or uh, systems that go into houses, they can go to the regulations and say, well, if I follow those uh, specifications, um, then I, I will achieve or I should achieve the building regulations. So it's probably more focused towards the, the one-off housing uh, market. So the deep methodology, uh, I won't say too much about it, but the current version that's out now is version 3.2. It's going to be replaced by a web-based deep four. Um, so there's going to be a lot more emphasis on, on hot water use because there's a recognition in, in a lot of these new houses that because they've got so efficient that 
uh, a lot most of the heating consumption is now through through water for generation of hot water there's also more detail on lighting so there's greater benefit for using low energy efficient uh, fittings and also uh there's a you can't over no longer over design your lighting so you know you would see a lot of architectural lighting in houses and i think there's a recognition that 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 couldn't be a high energy consumption so that you won't be able to do that anymore um there's also changes in how renewables are calculated uh the primary energy factors for the grid are based on five-year averages as opposed to fixed averages and wastewater heat recovery can be used as i mentioned part f has also been uh, upgraded um, and that's also out for for public consultation. There's been quite a significant changes to this, really, really in the domestic sector. Um, there's an inclusion of central continuous mechanical extract ventilation. I mean, when if this was put into current houses, it was compliant, but there's now some specific requirements in the Part F regulations. Um, natural ventilation is only uh, uh, permitted for air tightness levels of between three and five meters cubed per meter squared. It's so quite restrictive. So really, they're saying that a lot of these airtight buildings, that, houses that we have, um, you can't use natural ventilation in those because obviously they're they're very airtight. And um, so you have to have either continuous um, mechanical extract or uh, alternative uh, mechanical continuous mechanical ventilation system, including heat recovery. All these systems now have to be designed and installed by competent people, so competent designers and competent installers. Um, there's a new document it was referenced in older uh, regulations when never issued it was the installation and commissioning of ventilation system for dwelling, dwellings achieving compliance with part f there's a huge amount of detail on that it's quite a, a large document um but some of the things that are in there are this checklist for installation and commissioning and also mandatory operation and maintenance requirement for um for homeowners so i think there's a recognition that a lot of these particularly heat recovery uh, mechanical heat recovery ventilation systems were being installed in houses but not necessarily being uh, commissioned correctly and also not necessarily uh, sufficient information being given to the homeowners for them to know how to use those so there's a lot of information in terms of the the installation of any mechanical ventilation systems in that document so just briefly in terms of the cost um, so these are some of the estimated costs to uh, to comply with part l these are based on the cost optimal studies so to be honest they're they they look fairly modest um and i think in reality they're going to be quite a bit higher than those um at the moment we're not as i said we're really in transition in terms of these regulations there hasn't been a huge amount of billions probably not not any that i'm aware of anyway that have been built to these new regulations so i think those figures come from the cost optimal optimal reports but i would certainly take them with, with a, a large pinch of salt until we actually get into building a lot of these buildings on a large scale we really won't won't be sure what the costs are having said that um uh, we have actually have done this for a school in Galway where we, where we were working on a school and we had to to ap apply the TGD 33. So these were the, the, the uplifts and costs. <clears throat> so the total additional cost to comply with Part L 2017 was approximately 10%. Um, and actually, when you look back to what was in the cost optimal studies, they said for primary school it was 6.2 to 8 and 8.1 to 9.5. So we're not a million miles off that. So just in terms of a summary on how NZ impacts us. So for the M&E engineers, there's a lot more stringent specifications for HVAC systems. <coughs> uh, more in-depth building calculations are required, including NEEP and DEEP. Um, for the architect, increased requirements for building fabric and air tightness. Monetary calculations for thermal bridges now. Um, for the M&E &E engineer and the architect, much more co collaboration is now required from the outset. So there's a lot, a lot more front loading of your, your building energy consumption calculations before planning to ensure that the buildings that go into planning uh, can achieve in compliance. Um, and there's also increased, increased focus on site inspections and construction quality. <clears throat> on the contractor side, again, um, much more emphasis on construction quality around air tightness and insulation, thermal bridging, air tightness testing is mandatory. And there's also more emphasis uh, on, on commissioning and that bu buildings are commissioning correctly from the client perspective uh, obviously increased cost but a higher specification building ultimately means they're going to get a, a higher specification building and reduce running costs and they're also going to have more certainty on the quality of the product they're getting because of all the the, the inspection uh, increased inspections that are now required what's not mentioned there is the suppliers and the manufacturers so they're obviously going to be instrumental in this in, in delivering the technologies they're going to uh, allow us to achieve uh, NZEB in these in our new buildings 
but ultimately it's a, we're all uh, contributing to a better environment and a sustainable future. And just finally to mention that it's not just about energy that you know it's only one part of building sustainability sustainability so we shouldn't forget all our other <coughs> elements such as building site uh, access to public transport location the the, the um, construction materials etc so i think it's the likes of our, our uh, sustainability tools that i have up here they're they're also very important in sure buildings that are are really energy efficient but also sustainable uh, overall so just my conclusions, um, both those Part L documents for domestic and non-domestic buildings, they're extensive buildings and I'd certainly recommend that everybody take some time and read them. There's a huge amount of information in them. Um, the calculation mat- methodology for NEEP, uh, Orlo will speak about it. There is a revised version of that coming um, and also uh, for DEEP. And as I mentioned, Part L for dwellings is currently in public consultation. So I'd encourage everybody to read those documents and uh, have a submission so have your say this is your chance to have a say on on what those regulations are going to be and what's next so there is a a a revised uh uh, policy document from the eu and that's committing to cut co2 emissions by 40 percent by 2030 so there's a lot of detail in that i haven't read it at all but i believe there's a lot more emphasis on on smart technologies so as i said watch this space Um, this is just uh one step on the journey to more efficient buildings so thanks very much. Um, as I said, Orla is going to give a presentation now on the calculation methodologies. So uh, thanks, Owen, and thanks, Paul, for inviting me to speak, and thanks to Sibsi. Um, I'm a I'm a member of the Sibsi community, so uh, it's it's great to actually finally get to speak for you, to speak to you. I know Owen has been doing the tour nationwide, so. Uh, I'm glad to contribute. Uh, in terms of the, just to give you a summary, I, and Owen has covered this, so um, NZEB in terms of non-domestic buildings is a 60% improvement on the previous regulations. So it is an improvement in the fabric performance, it is an improvement in the efficiency of all our systems, and there is a kind of 10 to 20% uh, pri- requirement for renewable energy, which is new for, for non-domestic buildings and is probably one of the most onerous parts of the regulations. Uh, On the domestic side for NZEB, it's a 25% improvement on the current um, building regulations. So we're gone from an EPC of 0.4 down to 0.3. So what we have found in the regulatory impact assessment is that it's kind of a similar fabric performance, but we are either having to increase the PV or look at alternatives in terms of uh, introducing uh, MVHR with a boiler system or alternatively look at heat pumps. Um, So we have been doing quite a bit of work in terms of developing the whole methodology. One of the first things that is common to both the domestic and the non-domestic side is the primary energy factor. So as part of NZEB, a new um, ISO standard came out, it's 52,000, which was published in 2017 which gave guidelines as to how the primary energy factor should be calculated. And I don't know how clear the little graph or the little diagram on the um, right is, but basically what it is, is it calculates the amount of energy, primary energy going onto the grid, divided by the delivered energy from the grid. So if you think of um, your uh, all your um, electric uh, generating in terms of whether it's gas or coal, that has been produced, but also the renewables, the wind turbines. So it's all that energy going onto the grid, then divided by the delivered. And what we have done is we've based it on a five year average for the next five years. And that was based on energy projections from SEAI that published, SEAI published there um, last year. Um, And uh, that's where the the figure comes from. It's down at 1.94 is the proposed uh, primary energy factor. And it's 0.323 is the CO2 factor for uh, electricity. Uh, The other change that we have looked at, and again, it applies to both domestic and non-domestic, is the renewable energy ratio. And again, what we have done is followed to the guidelines in the ISO standard. And again, as Owen highlighted, we have um, a number of different technologies. You've got PV, solar, wind, heat pumps, biomass, biogas, district heating, and CHP. And the renewable energy is the total primary energy of the renewables divided by the total primary energy of um, the energy within the building. I'll just go back, actually. 
the renewable energy that contributes to the 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 OER has to be on site or nearby. So if you look at the again at the diagram, and again this is all part of the standard, um, PVs obviously wind turbine or heat pumps that are within on the site are obviously part are on site. Nearby is basically a district heating scheme. Um, what we don't take is obviously wind turbines that are feeding onto the grid or a PV system that's feeding onto the grid. That is not regarded as on site or nearby. To give you an idea of the calculations that are involved, um, basically, if you look at the diagram again, a PV system um, is it's a simple calculation of the electricity generated from that PV multiplied by uh, the the renewable primary energy factor, which in this case is going to be the grid electricity primary energy factor. So it's 1.94. And then that is divided by the total energy within the total primary energy within the building. And similarly, it would be for wind and solar and biomass. What you will see in on the biomass side is that we have split it into a, a renewable primary energy factor and a non-renewable primary energy factor. So um, again, I don't know how clear it is on the screen there, but on uh, for if you let's take biodiesel, the renewable primary energy factor of biodiesel is one, and then the non-renewable primary energy factor of biodiesel is 0.3. So the total primary energy factor for biodiesel is 1.3. So one is renewable and 0.3 is non-renewable. The other um, uh, impact here is district heating. So we are looking or we are talking to the likes of um, the pool bag incinerator or any kind of major district heating supplier and we're going to develop renewable renewable and non-renewable primary energy factors associated with those district heating systems and again they'll feed into the software and the calculations uh, with the heat pump and um, the methodology has changed uh, significantly enough since our compared to the domestic side or the, the previous domestic uh, methodology. So what we have done now, it's called the environmental energy. And again, this is taken directly from uh, the standards. So if you look at the, the heat pump over in the corner there, th if it has a COP of three and it's generating 100 kilowatts of uh, 100 kilowatt hours of heat, it means 33 kilowatt hours of electricity is going onto it or whatever fuel. What that means is that 30 or six, the 100 minus the 33, which is 67, is what is regarded as renewable. So it is a significant enough change from what was there previously in terms of the calculation. So uh, it, it is more in favor of heat pump technologies. Um, also with heat or CHP, and um, what we have done here is um, the renewable contribution is the saved energy, the saved primary energy. So what we are doing is comparing if you didn't have a CHP and you are supplying it with a gas boiler and grid electricity, what the equivalent, uh, what are the equivalents to that is of putting in your CHP and what the primary energy saved is associated with it. So in buildings other than dwellings and specific to those technologies, we have, or we're in the process of developing the NEEP methodology. Now, just to outline, the NEEP methodology is not just SBEM. It is SBEM, it's the front interface of SBEM, but it's also dynamic thermal modeling. So uh, SBEM at the moment is under development. We have been working quite closely with kind of key stakeholders like the HSC and the Department of Education in terms of developing the process um, and developing the methodology. And it, it's uh, including a few changes, which I'll go into in a few minutes. Uh, we also have been talking to a number of the dynamic thermal modelers, and I know quite a lot of you are probably interested in that side of it because you're um, using it on a day to day basis. Um, we have been talking to three of them. And again, we've had some positive reaction, but we, they are waiting to finalize. Um, they're waiting to see SBEM finalized with BRE before they kind of commit to whether they're going to develop it further. Um, but as I said, we've had some very positive from some of the suppliers and not so positive from the other. But um, we are in discussions with them and we're conscious that we want to try and develop that, so, that side of it. Uh, so in terms of the NEPA methodology, uh, what it means is it's an asset rating. So what we do is we compare your actual building to a reference building. Um, and what the actual building is based on is um, it's the installed hot water system or the efficiency of the installed hot water system, the efficiency of the installed lighting system, the efficiency of the fabric, 
the efficiency of the HEVAC system. But what we do have is a, a set weather data, set occupancy and set equipment. And what we do then is compare that to the reference building and Owen already highlighted what the reference building is in terms of the performance characteristics of it. I don't the 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 formatting on the slide has gone slightly askew. I don't know what happened to it, but uh, but that was that's basically the difference. So we have set out a new the new standards in terms of the reference building, and they are part of Partel. Now we've had a number of queries about what does that mean for your BER, and just to clarify, we're not changing the BER notional building. So the BER is calculated in a similar way, but it's compared to a notional building. And the, the parameters for the notional building haven't changed. So if you got a B1 two years ago, you should be getting a B1 now. It's not, that's not going to change at all. So um, just to clarify on that side. Wow, that formatting is really going to skew. So anyway, the, uh, uh, the, one of the things, as I said, is we have been in discussions with um, the likes of the HSE and a number of key stakeholders in terms of data centers and all the rest and how you deal with process loads and specialist processes. Um, if you look at the reference building and the way the reference building is defined, the, the cooling in it is equivalent to an active chilled beam system. So obviously an operating theater who has uh, specific requirements in terms of the process that's going on within the operating theater would never put in a, a district heating scheme or a, a chilled beam system. So what we have done is we have set thresholds. So if you have if you're going above a certain threshold in terms of the ventilation you're supplying to the space, we will then compare that space to the equivalent in terms of a high performing system that is uh, of equivalent standard. So it would, if it's a constant air volume system, it would be a similar standard to constant air volume system rather than comparing it to um, a chilled beam system. Similarly, on the uh, renewable side, we are not expecting or the, the, the idea of the OER calculation is that it was not going to be compared um, or you weren't trying to get the renewable element for the whole process. It was actually to do with what is what, what are regarded are the regulated loads. So um, we are kind of creating a third calculation where we're calculating the energy performance of your building based on those regulated loads and calculating the renewable energy performance based on that. So that's some of the, some of the reasons why there's a delay in terms of getting the software out is because of all this consultation that we've had with the various different parties and the changes in the calculations. Um, it's just delayed the software slightly. Um, other changes... Um, that we're making to SBEM and, and the software is um, on the activity database. We uh, have been in deep discussions with the Department of Education. One of the things that they highlighted to us was the hot water demand that SBEM used to calculate was very high um, for primary schools where they felt that in reality they don't have that kind of what hot water demand. So we are updating the activities based on that. Um, we're, so we're making them uh, Irish specific. Also, this, the school year for, in Ireland is very different to the school year in the UK. So again, there are kind of changes we're making. Um, also, in the likes of offices, you'll see that, and I, again, I don't know how clear the presentation is, but uh, it's 0.33 was the um, hot water demand, 0.33 litres per day per person or per metre squared. That's actually reduced uh, down to 0.19. So it's, you know, it's reduced. So there's a number of changes like that where they're more specific and more accurate reflection of the uh, of the usage. Um, again, a few other changes that SBEM uh, that we're introducing within SBEM is that we are looking at more than one heating system. Um, so previously you would have had to do a bivalent calculation where you'd have to do manually do the calculation It'll now be done within the uh, software. There's the introduction of variable speed pumps, uh, demand controlled ventilation, and also LED lighting is uh, now a kind of default within the software. So in terms of what it all means, uh, the interim methodology. So if you have an office building, this is um, a compliance. Uh, this is a building that is in compliance with the interim methodology to kind of give you an idea of the, the performance level. So the walls had a U-value of 0.2, the roof had a U-value of 0.15, the floor had a U-value of 0.16. And again, a lot of you would be designing to those kind of standards anyway. The glazing was actually double glazing with a U-value of 1.8. 
and a solar transmittance of 0.33. The air permeability was three meters cubed and the thermal bridging was equivalent to the ACDs. The ventilation strategy was natural ventilation with a split system in the meeting rooms, but there was full uh, monitoring and targeting on the lighting and the HVAC. The efficiency uh, was a 92% boiler. The cooling was uh, had a performance of 3.5 and the lighting was 2.5 watts per meter squared per 100 lux and had full daylighting and occupancy control. So that building was in compliance when it had PV and the PV covered 12% of the floor area. It was equivalent in terms of area to 12% of the floor area. And again, that in some way highlights the issues that um, in terms of if you have high rise buildings and city centre locations, can you do you have enough space for the PV? What is uh, an issue or what is a factor and something that you should be conscious of as, as building service engineers is that if you put in full air conditioning, you may get compliance in terms of your EPC and CPC, but you can see what it does to your PV. It's gone from 12% of the floor area up to 23. So it's nearly doubled the PV requirement within that building. So again, just be conscious of it in terms of how you're addressing this with your client, that if they're going for full uh, air conditioning systems, that they can impact on the, the RER side of it. Uh, this is another example. It was a laboratory building, but again, it shows you kind of the specification. In this particular one, you can see that the, the fabric was uh, slightly better than, than the previous example, but that has to do more to do with the fact that um, it had a significant uh, area that was uh, ventilated with a VAV system in terms of the labs. So um, the walls are 0.15, the roof was 0.13, the floor is 0.1, glazing was 1.4, air permeability and thermal bridging were similar to the previous. It did have natural ventilation in the offices and support areas, but in the VAV system it was higher. The lighting was 1.5 watts per meter squared. So again, it was a very high performing lighting system. And in this particular case, it was a combination of the CHP um, providing 60% of the domestic hot water and um, heating and then uh, photovoltaics then for 3% of the floor area. But it gives you a flavor of what is required in terms of compliance with the, the NZ requirements. The one thing I will say is that uh, NZEB and, N or, and the NEEP methodology is an asset rating. It is not an operational performance. Um, so it is a set occupancy, set weather conditions, set temperature, set equipment, set usage profile, set water demand. So we do recommend that you do uh, a full energy analysis based on your parameters for your building. So it's looking at your actual op or occupancy, your profiles, your temperatures, your equipment. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Exceed that uh, with, within SEAI, we have a certification scheme, which is um, for energy efficiency design, where you basically, uh, you get an independent EED expert or energy efficiency design expert who actually reviews the, um, the design and, uh, you know, asks those questions, you know, like, uh, you know, what temperature is uh, the chilled water off your chiller versus, you know, how many hours operating is it? Or, you know, it's those kind of details that wouldn't be picked up on in the NEEP methodology and the and NZEB compliance. So, as I said, we would recommend that you, you go down that route. And I know a number of the public bodies actually already kind of implement it as part of their design process. So, again, it's something that you should consider. Uh, on the dwelling side, then, um, as Owen said, we did a detailed regulatory impact assessment and what we found, and I'm sure as you've all found over the recent years, is that the likes of apartments are finding it very hard to comply um, with the, the, the uh, building regulations. And the reasons they were finding it hard to comply was because um, the space heating was reduced so much that the, the, the contribution um, there was little more that they could do in terms of the fabric or and that side of it. This uh, shows you a prime example where the hot water, the primary uh, water, primary water heating was equivalent to uh, nearly 75% of the load within the apartment. And what we found is that the daily usage didn't change um, between the previous methodology and the new, or between previous regulations and the new regulations. So that was one of the things that we've addressed in deep going forward. We've looked at the daily hot water usage and how we um, 
can accurately account for it or can, can be, be more accurately account for it. So what we have allowed for in the methodology and as Owen said, the part L is out for public consultation. I'll just make you aware the not only is are the examples within the TGD uh, part L, but there are six Excel versions of the of of the deep tool and these changes on the website. So feel free to download them and make changes and play around with them and see do they make sense and comment on them. The public consultation ends on, on the 8th of June. So now is your chance. Um, but what uh, you will be allowed to do is um, account for if you have flow restrictors or um, if you um, have uh, water consumption targets um, like metering or rainwater harvesting and on that side of it, it'll all feed into reducing your hot water demand within the actual building uh, and it, it help in terms of uh, achieving NZ compliance. The other side of it is on the lighting. And again, what we found, obviously the lighting calculation that was there previously for uh, domestic was very basic. It was just a count of how many energy efficient lights you had or a percentage of how many energy efficient lights you have. We're now for new buildings going, getting into more detail in terms of putting in what the installed lighting is, what the wattage is, what the efficiency of your fittings are. And again, Part of that is that if it's under designed, you'll be penalized. And if you're over designing, you'll be penalized. It's, it's so that uh, appropriate lighting designs are actually implemented in, in dwellings. Um, on the existing buildings, and uh, just to highlight, we, you're, we're not expecting you to do full lighting design on the existing buildings. And that will be similar to the, the old process of counting the number of light fittings and um, which ones are energy efficient on that side of it. So. Um, there's other changes coming in as well. Uh, we are going to be uh, there was a public or there was a consultation on deep um, uh, a year or two ago, and um, some of the changes that were highlighted as part of that public consultation are also going to be implemented, which include uh, allowing for fixed cooling, allowing allowing for more than one main heating system. I know or if any of you have had any issues with trying to define what your main heating system is and your secondary heating system is. We're trying to alleviate some of that pain um, obviously introducing the high retention storage heaters, uh, curtain walling again on apartment blocks is becoming more prevalent. So we'll be providing guidance on that side of it and um, looking at the efficiency adjustments for heat recovery systems that are uninsulated, the wastewater heat recovery and also the inclusion of electric showers. So if you have electric showers, that hot water demand that is associated with them is actually removed from your hot water demand, but it comes in with a big electricity uh, factor. So again, there are some of the changes that are going to be included within uh, the deep methodology. Um, so other factors then, renewables, we are trying to, uh, and we're looking to see how we can develop this, but again, it shouldn't be a tick box exercise. It shouldn't be slapping up and I, I don't know if we've all heard the stories of pvs sitting on the roof of of houses but never actually get connected or never the, the developer never pays for the inverter or whatever the case may be so again part of this process is trying to make sure that we're not it's not just a tick box exercise um and putting in renewables that are appropriate for the building design one of the things that you will see um as part of the regulations and again own commented on um the, requir the requirements and commissioning. One of the things that you might see uh, is on the energy management or the energy uh, controls and monitoring. So if you have large systems, if they're over 70 kilowatts in terms of heating or cooling, you, there is a requirement now under the building regulations that you have a, a building automation control system. So, and part of that is monitoring the renewable energy from your building. So uh, again, we're trying to ensure that uh, your renewables are appropriately uh, installed and designed. And we are conscious that it's one of the, the issues uh, in terms of um, trying to achieve compliance on the on the non-domestic side. Uh, other considerations are obviously the building services and the human factors and the building envelope. So uh, in terms of the human <coughs> factors, we want to make these buildings are comfortable and um, user friendly. But on the building services side, we have to think of the maintenance and the and that they're uh, high performance. And then on the, the building envelope um, that it's uh, uh, it's the low hanging fruit in terms of trying to achieve or get the fabric first approach. 
Um, Sibsi yourselves have published uh, a good practice in, in design of homes that again is worth reading in terms of uh, the guidance that it gives. Thermal bridging, it is becoming um, an issue or it is becoming something that is that needs further review and further consideration compared to previous uh, building regulations. And it's also an easy win in a lot of ways in terms of if you do go and do those detailed calculations and do the, the side, calcula side value calculations, it can help in terms of compliance rather than putting on that extra PV or whatever the case may be. It can help in terms of if you if you go off and do those detailed calculations in terms of achieving compliance on the overheating side again um there are guidelines sibsi them as you saw, yourselves have published uh guidelines for overheating in uh homes and non-domestic buildings and they are the go-to if you are if you've got complex buildings and, and you're having issues with overheating they, they are what we're recommending are, are part of the building regulations for compliance the uh, calculation in terms of the solar gain and the one meter high window will actually be part of the SBEM calculation and it will, uh, the SBEM will spit out um, a non-compliance for it. So if, if you do not achieve the, the one, if you're not equivalent to one meter high window at 0.68 G value, then um, the compliance report that you get out of SBEM will say that you're not, you're not in compliance. So again, be conscious of that going forward. Um, ventilation obviously is, a, is an issue and the, we have the new regulations. I won't, cut, I won't touch on that too much because I've only covered a lot of it. But again, the final one is here is engaging the building user. That photograph that I have there is, a, is a, an apartment that I went to visit um, where they were showing off the, the heat recovery systems. And the one fuse that switched off is actually the heat recovery system. It was in the peak of winter and the windows were open the, the the homeowner was a it was it was a council um apartment and the homeowner just hadn't engaged or didn't know well not that she hadn't engaged but she wasn't aware of what the what it was and why it was humming away in the background and had issues with it so as service engineers and i presume the majority of you here are service engineers i think it's critical that we install technology that the, the building owner is familiar or our building user is familiar with and, and can use appropriately. We are also just um, just one clarification on what uh, Owen said. Deep 4 is currently out for soft launch, I think, and that is not NZEB compliant. So there's going to be a, a web based version of Deep 4 before uh, the NZEB part is introduced. In terms of the legislation, we are um, the public consultation for on for dwellings ends in um, on the eighth of June, uh, and then we're hoping to publish Part L dwellings by the end of July, and then Deep Four kind of August or September October. That's just to give you an idea of the timelines. So the Deep Four that comes out before, like it, it, it has been launched as a soft. Uh, landing and I think they've, they've, uh, some people have actually published BURs on it is not NZEB compliant. Uh, one of the other things we're doing within SEAI is the advisory report and trying to make it more uh, user friendly for the homeowners to kind of give them some guidance. So again, it is about engaging the homeowners and the building owners uh, in um, the energy performance side. So that's it for me. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a million to Owen and Orla, particularly for giving up their time this evening and all the preparation that goes into all these presentations, nearly 100 slides. We all know how long these, uh, these presentations take, so thank you very much for that. So I think it's great today we're showing that SIBSI members are at the forefront of Part L, NZ, Part F. So please do get involved, become a member if you like, or become a member of Engineers Ireland, but do become a member of a society that relates to engineering. Um, the guidelines that they're shown here today are all free to members. In fact, if you're a member, there's over 200 guidance documents that are there that are worth to non-members about €6,800. So they're all free to download, etc. Um, so there is all available on sibsi.org or if you want to come to our website and check out all events that are up to date over the next year or so. Again, 50th year, so major events on this year. Um, 
and don't forget the SIBSI awards. We really want to see submissions in for that. So if you have any projects, please work with your contractor or your designer and uh, please submit. So we'll take some questions. Orla has to head quite soon. She has to go all the way down to NACE. So if we could kind of leave it till about 15 minutes. So have we any questions? One question, brilliant. Okay. <coughs> Uh, very interesting uh, presentation, um, and I could see the sense of making the buildings more efficient. But what struck me was that as you make the buildings more and more efficient, you must get declining returns on the extra investment you have to make to reach the target. And when you look at the impact assessment, you'd see, for instance, maybe gas boiler plus PV, but it's one package. And I would imagine if you dug into it, you find that you've got a good return maybe on the gas boiler and a very, very poor return on the PV because, you know, you, you, you'd, you'd added on a, a lumpy investment and you were only getting a small return. And it seemed to me that the crux of that would come down to the requirement to have the renewables on the building or nearby. And I know in other countries, or in some other countries, residents can simply buy a uh, PV panel on a solar farm, and that meets their obligations. Yep, so just uh, <coughs> clarifying that, so as part of the Energy Performance and Buildings Directive, the definition for NZ is, first of all, that it has to be cost optimal, which is basically cost optimal study that Owen referred to, and that also that the renewables have to be on site or nearby, and it specifically defines that. And um, even the, the the 20% that we have proposed, uh, the, the EU would actually regard as small, or you know, but we're justifying that 20% based on all the renewables that are going onto the grid in terms of the wind and, and yeah. the other side of it. Hmm. So there is a clear definition that there is a requirement for renewables on site or nearby. Um, in terms of the return of investment, um, the cost optimal study that defined these building regulations, the current building regulations, was done in 2013. We are actually in the middle of doing or starting the process of doing the next set of building or cost optimal studies. So we are actually revising all the costs, and this will define the next set of building regulations under the um, Energy Performance and Buildings Directive. We have to do this on a five year cycle. So we are already starting the process of looking at the next set of figures. But um, yeah, so the, the uh, definition of NZEB or where NZEB came from and that side of it was defined under the cost optimal study and the level of performance that we need to meet. That was a life cycle assessment um, that was carried out. The renewables requirement for on-site or nearby is at EU level. And um, if other countries that aren't, aren't doing it on-site mm. or nearby are not in compliance. And what's the definition of nearby? So nearby is, if, if I can't go back to this, I don't know if you can go back to the slide there, Paul, but yeah. basically near, nearby is defined as a district heating. It has to be directly connected. It can't go through the grid. So again, as part of the standard, it actually defines what nearby mm. is. Um, so again, anyone who isn't doing on-site or nearby is not in compliance. And the, mm. the EU are quite strict in it in terms of coming down and in enforcing the directive. There it is on. So if, if you can see there, uh, you can see that the, the, there's a district heating scheme. Again, it, there, there's more definition in the actual standard, but C would be what is regarded as a, a nearby system, whereas a grid connection, which is you know your wind turbine onto the mm. grid, is not regarded as nearby. Mm. I know. I'm just it's just I know that solar farms are supposed to be a third of the cost of PV on the roof. So you wonder, it's the same generation. So yeah, and, and I know we've had we've had um, like. Again, we've had a lot of uh, stakeholder meetings, uh, Department of Housing and ourselves have had a lot of stakeholder meetings with various different groups, including like the likes of HSC. And again, the common crux is that, you know, they're finding it hard to put renewables on buildings in very tight sites. And the question is, you know, is there something that can be done on a, on a district level that, you know, could feed into it? But again, it has to be within the definition. And the primary, sorry, one other, the primary <coughs> energy factor, you've taken an average over five years, mm -hmm. 
but the investment is obviously a third year, fourth year like. Um, if you take the Fermi Energy factor over longer than five years, would you have got a substantially different figure? Um, yeah, so uh, not substantially different. Um, we, we, we have looked at the figures, um, so I've, I've, I've looked at them within SEAI, and it's, a, 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 it's actually a question that was raised internally with us as well. So if we looked at it up to 2035, um, I think the average um, primary energy factor is, is 1.86, or it's around that, so it wasn't, it wasn't was significantly right? a difference, but it was, it was slightly better. Mm. The problem with going too far forward is like it, it's based on energy modeling that is carried out, and again, the energy modelers will say, "Look, we can't. Like, they can only go so far in terms of predicting it." Mm. Now, there's certain things that are happening in you know 2030 and 2035 in terms of ability with coal on that side, which are benefiting, but also the amount of energy um, that is used is you know the, the, the profile of the energy use is also going to change. So, um, that's one of the reasons we didn't go that far ahead was because it's hard to predict that far ahead. But even with predicting it, it wasn't that significant a difference. Mm. Okay. Could I ask you one question, Orly? You related to <laughs> I'll ask you tomorrow. Um, but you were talking about in terms of district heating, in terms of having a factor for renewables as opposed to other. Are they based on fuels or on the type of unit that's used? So, so the likes of um, uh, it'll be based on the renewables within the district heating. So if you think of um, like one of the one of the examples was waste heat from a data center. Right. right? So the waste heat on um, by itself is not renewable mm. under the renewables directive. Okay. But if a re if that renewable so the the waste heat comes off uh, for data centers comes off at about twenty five degrees, it mm -hmm. has to go into a heat pump anyway. Mm -hmm. But the heat pump efficiency the will be renewable. Okay. Opinion. Very so good. It's not the waste heat, but the the, re the heat pump. These are, like, there's a number of examples like that that need to be worked through, yeah. and we need to have those discussions with the various uh, district heating suppliers. Excellent. But we have started the discussion. The question I here? I wanted to get a clarification, I think it was in Owen's presentation, regarding existing buildings. When they go through a change of use, does the planning application need to be lodged? Um, is it after March 2019 when the end that then applies to whatever modifications may or take place in the building? So it depends whether it's domestic or non-domestic. Non-domestic. Sorry? Non-domestic. Well, it's the 1st of January uh, 2019 is the non-domestic. Okay, so that applies. Yeah. And what about protected buildings, protected structures? The, they're exempt as per the normal regulations. In the regulation, it seems to say that for the, uh, you know, refurbishment of buildings where you did more than 25%, you need to bring it to a standard that was technically uh, feasible and economically reasonable. Yeah. Um, how do you work out what economically reasonable is? So the technically, economically and functionally feasible yeah. <laughs> uh, definition is actually as per the cost optimal or and the regulatory impact assessment. But the cost optimal is in relation to a uh, you know, new build. You know, the very fact no, 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 the, co the cost optimal we also look at refurbishment and okay. major renovation. So the part of the cost optimal also defines major renovation. So that is where the technically, economically, and functionally feasible definition came from, and the figures that are used there are, are from that and part okay. of the regulatory impact assessment. Now, if you had a particular case that you felt wasn't mm. technically, functionally, economically feasible, then it would be for you to demonstrate that to the building. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else here? Go ahead. Go ahead. implemented as part of this, this draft but that's not to say that with the next cost I, as I said the next we're in the process of starting the next cost optimal study so that's not to say in five years time it won't be implemented or sooner so but it's, uh, it's but the, current, the current the uh, current draft that's out there is not um, it's not planning the fossil fuels okay one minute, yep Uh, 
Um, so in which ca a case in domestic or non-domestic? Yeah, non so in non-domestic, um, so basically uh, the whole on the building control side of it, um, I know the, the building the building regulations of our Department of Housing are working with their BCAR and their um, building control officers in terms of developing a methodology for, for doing compliance checking and they will be producing, as far as I know, a detailed checklist of this is what you need to produce to, to, to show compliance. Um, but that's, that's as far as I know, or I'm not. It's not in there. <coughs> Yeah, there's and that's we hope. yeah. So they're yeah. trying to they're trying to define it in more detail yeah. in terms of because again, it's it's a lot of information. So they're trying to get more detail behind the background of it. So I know they're working on it at the moment. Not you in the meantime. I think what we do now is up to all the I'd say those certified staff by themselves as much as they whatever they can produce. Because mm -hmm. yeah. we're in that situation now. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I will say the, the new SBEM software will produce the, the compliance check. It actually goes into a lot more detail than, other than what was there previously. Yeah. So that will feed into it as well. That there is a, this, is it, the numbers I saw, they'll actually look at the efficiency of your HVAC systems, efficiency of your lighting systems, the solar gain check. You know, so there's a number of things that are going to be checked as part of, that are produced as part of the compliance check uh, report that comes out of that. Okay, I'll take one more question if you have it. Okay. One more, come on. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. No, no, go on ahead yourself, yeah. Well, how is the heat retention uh, <coughs> storage heater treated under the regulations? Um, if we're using a lot of electricity, presumably if it's used at night, it's using wind power rather than anything else. Yeah, it's, it's uh, now, so um, with the retention heater, it's to do with the efficiency and the responsiveness, mm. which is fed into the deep software. Um, it doesn't distinguish at the moment, we don't distinguish at the moment when we use nighttime electricity and daytime electricity in terms of the, the deep <coughs> methodology and, and that might be the next phase to be honest, but it's not, mm. the, it's not proposed at the moment. Yeah, because it, it struck me that there's no control of immersion heating either, yeah. you know, whereas obviously the trick would be to just simply turn on these heaters when the surface wind on the system. Yeah, so uh, I, I think Owen mentioned something about um, the new building regulation, or the new, the next draft of the EPBG uh, that is due out, it was agreed with uh, the EU there in last month. And mm. um, a couple of things that are coming out of it are what is called a smart readiness indicator. So how it will look at those kind of controls, and it'll be, you know, they're going to be looking at that kind of side of it in terms of how intelligent your building is to cope with the new roof coming on at night time or whatever the case may mm. be. And um, it'll be looking at EVs. Also feed more into the deep retrofit and major renovation side of it. But it, that that is something that is coming down the tracks in terms of the smart smartness of your building. And in terms of smartness, would that be treated as renewable then? No. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Well, it'll be treated as renewable if you're taking in renewable, but uh, but renewable is only if it's if it's not coming from. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Go on, Declan. We'll give you one last one. Go on. On the storage, is it specifically referring to storage heating, or is it storage in terms of energy storage, like you know, thermal storage, mm. the power storage? In which case, now sorry, uh, the, the high retention storage heater. Yeah, that is th that's just a specific technology, and um, so it's it's like your uh, electric storage heaters, but it's a uh, high so retention electric storage heater. Let's say thermal storage would be a, a feature of using renewables. It's yeah. certainly using them well. Uh, is there anything? You get any, is there anything to show that you're doing it well? Uh, no, but I, what we are, the, another part of the the, um, the SBEM update, it's not actually on um, DEEP, but another part of SBEM, actually it is on DEEP because it's there in the right that way, is that we'll be able to feed in, so say you have a renewable on site that is a process load that's not actually accounted for in SBEM, so to speak. We are going to be able, you're going to be able to input that renewable into the software. So if it's something like that where you're using, uh, you know, say you have a process load or, you know, that is over in the corner that is feeding into a storage unit or a thermal storage unit, that we're developing a methodology as to how you'd input that into SBEM. So 
have to like just be the next phase. Yeah. Okay. Thanks everyone for giving up the last day of summer. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you all soon. Thank you very much. And thanks to Owen and Orla.